shared my screen. Let me hope all of you are seeing it well. Yes. When I yes. move, yes. the yes. are they moving from your side? Yes, it is clear. Okay. All right. So today we are going to look at labor and its nursing care. Um, by names, Kiden Robina, and I will be taking you through this session. Um, first of all, we look at the learning objectives. So by the end of this session, we expect that students should be able to explain the various theories of labor onset, discuss the critical elements of assessing maternal and fetal well-being during labor, formulate simple nursing diagnosis related to labor and de uh, delivery, establish comprehensive nursing care plans to meet the unique needs of the woman, and then plan and implement nursing interventions that align with the established care plans. So this is where a nursing process will come in basically. As you can see, starting from assessment, diagnosis, then planning for the care, and then uh, implementing or providing the care. So let us look at normal labor. What do we mean when we talk about normal labor? Normal labor is the process of delivering a baby through the birth canal. It involves a series of coordinated events that result in the dilation of the cervix, the descent of the fetus, and the expulsion of the placenta. So all this process from the time that the mother starts feeling the pain due to the contractions until the cervix is dilated, uh, the baby descends and is expelled out and the placenta is also expelled out, all that fall under normal labor. So if the whole process goes through without any complication, without any challenge, then it is termed to be normal. So when we look at delivery, delivery refers to the actual event of birth. In other words, we are referring to that event of the fetus being expelled out. That is what we refer to as, um, as delivery. So let's look at theories of labor onset. We have uterine stretch theory, oxytocin stimulation theory, a theory of the aging placenta, progesterone deprivation theory, uh, prostaglandin theory, raising fetal cortisol level. So we are going to look at this one by one. First, let's start with the uterine stretch theory. So this theory suggests that the uterus has a maximum capacity to stretch and they accommodate the growing fetus. When the uterus contracts and it triggers labor. So in other words, the uterus can expand as big as it can, but it also has a limit. So with this theory, it is believed that when that limit of expansion of the uterus reaches, then it cannot expand anymore. So the only option is for it to contract and make sure that it expels out uh, the content that are in it. Then the second theory is about oxytocin stimulation theory. So this theory proposes that oxytocin, which is a hormone that stimulates uterine contractions, is released in response to various stimuli such as nipple stimulation, cervical dilation, or fetal movements. So oxytocin then initiates and maintains labor. And that is why you see in the uh, labor ward, when the mother is laboring and uh, more so in the second stage, midwives sometimes take that initiative of who stimulating the nipples of the breast to make sure that they initiate the production of oxytocin that will lead to uh, contractions leading to cervical dilatation and the expulsion of the fetus. Then the other theory is the theory of the aging placenta. So in this theory, it is believed that 
the placenta, which provides nutrients and oxygen to the fetus, deteriorates over time and produces less progesterone, which is a hormone uh, that inhibits uterine contractions. So as a result, when the progesterone levels uh, become low, because the progesterone is the one that was preventing contractions to take place, so when the progesterone levels become low, then uh, automatically contractions will set in, and as a result, the uh, delivery of the baby can happen. Then the other theory is the progesterone deprivation uh, theory. So this theory is similar to the one that we have talked about, about the theory of aging placenta. Uh, but it focuses on the role of the estrogen. So and the estrogen, as we have talked about before, is another hormone that stimulates uterine contractions. So according to this theory, estrogen levels raise as progesterone levels fall which then create a hormonal imbalance that leads to labor. So uh, when the woman is pregnant, the two are balanced. The progesterone is balanced. The progesterone is the one that is responsible for maintenance of the pregnancy. Then the estrogen uh, comes in uh, to bring in contractions. So when they are when their levels are maintained in the body normally the baby the, the fetus grows normally until uh, term so it is believed that when it, it reaches term the progesterone levels go down so when the progesterone levels lower then automatically the uh, estrogen levels will go high and as a result contractions will set in immediately and hence delivery then the other theory is about pro prostaglandin theory. So the prostaglandin uh, theory emphasizes the role of prostaglandins, which cause inflammation and pain. We have talked about that also uh, for the nurses. If you have been looking at medical surgical, you have at least talked about inflammation, you have talked about pain, and in such two, you cannot miss mentioning about prostaglandin because they are the ones that are responsible uh, for uh, inflammation and pain. So it is believed that in a labor, when the, the fetal membranes and the placenta produce uh, prostaglandins, these prostaglandins that is produced by the uh, placenta and the fetal membranes and increase the uterine sensitivity and the contractility. And the, as a result, uh, con uh, the, the contractions will set in, then uh, the fetus will be expelled. So prostaglandins also soften and ripen the cervix, preparing it for labor, making it easy to uh, expand and the, uh, I mean to dilate and the, uh, for if it's meant to take place. So rising fetocortisol level is the other theory that we are looking at. So this theory suggests that the fetus is active in initiating labor by producing cortisol. Uh, cortisol is a stress hormone which stimulates the production of prostaglandins and the oxytocin. So this takes us back to the former theories that we have talked about. So cortisol also reduces the production of prostaglandin, I mean the production of progesterone, and hence allowing labor to occur, as we have explained before. Let's look at the preliminary signs of labor. So in this, we have lightening as one of the signs of labor. So uh, when we talk about lightening, lightening is a, uh, a situation that occurs in a uh, term pregnancy where the presenting part of the fetus enters into the pelvis. And as a result, it, leads, uh, it creates space above uh, the umbilicus or just before the zephystena and this allows 
for the mother to have that relief and she can breathe easily as she feels relieved because there is at least space for her to breathe. So lightening, this refers to the descent of the fetal presenting part into the pelvis. Uh, effects on the mother, it leads to relief of this dyspnea, increased the frequency of urination, uh, leg cramps, increase the vaginal discharge, decrease the uh, fundal height. So all these ones are the ones that result as uh, the as lightening takes place. Other preliminary signs of labor include. Uh, increase in the level of activity, the activity of the or the activity of the fetus increase. The fetus start moving vigorously. Then, uh, Braxton Hicks contractions also come in, where the the uterus becomes the heart, and if it is felt from outside, it can be felt that it is hard, though the mother will not be feeling pain. Then ripening of the cervix that is normally done on internal assessment. You can feel that the cervix is feeling soft. Then vaginal loss, uh, sorry, weight loss. The mother uh, in most cases loses weight during this time when she is attending into uh, labor and delivery. Then signs of uh, true labor uterine contractions this is the first thing when she starts feeling the pain and this pain is in most cases effective productive and evolutory it does it is not initiated by anything it starts on its own and it is progressive it continues until the results are realized. Does not start, then stop. If it starts and stop, then that is a false labor. It is not true. Those are not true contractions. Then the other sign is a show. Um, and the show is made up of cervical mucus, which is mixed with the uh, blood. They are blood. And this one comes uh, from the uh, nearby. Uh, veins. So what happens is during pregnancy, there's what is called the operculum, which covers the cervix of the uh, of the uterus to make sure that uh, microorganisms do not enter into the uterus and cause infections to the fetus. So when the cervix now becomes soft in the preparation of the mother going into labor because of the effect of the prostaglandins, then this uh, operculum now detaches from the cervical opening and as it detaches and the, because the, the cervix is being taken up there's that uh, dilatation that is taking place because of that stress some of the veins will uh, rupture though it is not something that is severe. So there's some stains of blood that will mix together with the disease uh, cervical mucus, which is the operculum, then it is discharged through the vagina. And when vagina examination is done, such can be observed on the gloved fingers. Let's look at stages of labor. Labor is divided into three stages. We have the first stage, which involves dilatation and effacement. Then stage two, which involves pushing and the birth of the baby. Then stage three, which involves delivery of the placenta. Let's look at first stage. The first stage is the longest and consists of two phases. We have the early labor and the active labor. So during the early labor, the cervix dilates and the effaces. When we talk about effacement, effacement is the is the is the uh, thinning of the cervix. The th the cervix becomes thin, so that is thinning of the cervix as it is being taken up is what we call effacement. Then uh, dilatation is the opening of the cervical os. So this happens and the contractions are mild and 
irregular during this time of labor. So during active labor, the cervix dilates more rapidly and the, the contractions become stronger and more frequent. So in the active phase of labor, physiologic response. So here, the physiologic responses that we get is one, cervix dilates about four to seven centimeters. So from zero up to uh, before four centimeters, that is considered to be uh, early labor. But uh, from uh, four centimeters up to seven centimeters, the mother is now in what? In the active phase of first stage of labor. So that happens. Then uh, another physiologic response is progressive fetal descent. So the descent of the fetus occurs progressively. It, it, it occurs continuously. Uh, contractions have frequent frequency of two to five minutes uh, during a duration of 40 to 60 seconds and the moderate uh, strong intensity. So here what happens is the mother can get the contractions. She stays for two to five minutes, then she gets another contraction again. This is what happens in the active phase of labor. And these contractions are in most cases lasting for uh, 40 to 60 minutes. So that means that they are between moderate and strong. 40 to 60 minutes, those are between moderate and strong. So they keep on alternating around there. So that is what it means. Then um, we still continue with the physiologic response. Uh, women with the support have Oh, we, this is now the psychologic response. So women with the support have greater satisfaction and less anxiety. That means that women who have uh, people supporting them, staying with them, they normally uh, have greater satisfaction. They feel that they are being attended to, so they don't become so anxious. So uh, start to feel helpless turning to nurse for increased participation. So this is a situation where you find the mother is always calling for the nurse or the midwife to come and attend to her because she may not be sure of what is happening and she really needs that support. Partners talk support uh, response. So ensures patient is not left alone. So the partner has to ensure at this time that the patient is not left alone. Then also the partner reassures the patient, uh, maintaining support and encouragement, telling the mother words like you are going, you will make it, be strong. The pain is always there, but it is we encourage that the mother should not be given false encouragement false uh, uh, false statements like the pain will not be much and yet we know that the pain during labor is really really uh, so strong and much so the mother has to be told the truth that you are going to go through a lot of pain and this is what all mothers go through before they are being called mothers so you have to endure the process because you love your child and you want your child to be uh, healthy when you deliver him or her. So the truth has to be revealed to the mother and the mother has to be encouraged to be strong. In a latent or early phase, a psychological responses, here anxiety increases as contractions also intensify. So when the contractions become so painful, the anxiety will also increase. Um, the mother, in most cases, can have a fear of loss of control. So uh, this feeling of, will I be able to make it? Shall I really be able to push this baby? Things like that can happen to the mother. Then decrease the ability to cope, 
a sense of helplessness, feeling like she's going to lose it, she's not going to make it, such kind of feelings can start developing. Then anxiety increases with the force of contractions, this I've talked about it, uh, restless, frequent position changes. So the mother in most cases becomes restless, cannot sit in one place. When she's sitting and the pain comes, she sometimes can get up or uh, start standing around. Why? Because she's feeling the pain. Latent stroke early phase, partner stroke uh, support response. So partner or supervisor supports actively. So during this phase, the partner has to be there to give a support throughout the period. Restlessness, offering position changes. If the mother is restless and she wants to change to another kind of pos uh, position, the partner should be there to give support to make sure that she changes to another uh, position. Then comforting words and the actions, uh, like you are going to make it, uh, then also massaging the mother's back, uh, touching the mother gently. Uh, the partner should not use a lot of force, but should do touch the mother gently, more so around the back. This can help to soothe the pain. Signs and symptoms of first stage. So the reason why I was talking about that gentle massage on the back is because of the back ache that the mother is feeling. And this is because of the opening of the uh, coccyx. We all know that uh, the coccyx will uh, turn uh, downwards, outwards during delivery. But uh, also during that uh, navigation, as the fetus tries to navigate through the pelvis, finding its way out, it is what causes the backache. So the mother will feel backache, she will have that lower abdominal cramps, uh, pelvic pressure will be there, and that is why uh, at this point, in most cases, when the mother has to urine, she has to empty her bladder regularly, and she also has to uh, pass feces in case she feels like. Then um, blood show can also be uh, seen. This the show I have already explained to you what it is. Then regular contractions occur 30 to 60 seconds every 5 to uh, 7 minutes. Then at the transition phase, the transition phase, we are looking at the phase beyond the uh, 7 centimeters of dilatation. So she is transitioning into second stage of labor. So this is called the transition phase of labor. So the physiologic response here, last part, this is the last part of the first stage. The, the dilatation averages 0 0.5 centimeters per hour for nulliparas and 0 0.3 centimeters per hour for multiparas. So for mothers who are multiparas, they will they dilate slower that's why they dilate at 0 0.3 centimeters per hour. Whereas the ones who are giving birth for the first time, the one that we call the nulliparas, will dilate at 0 0.5 centimeters per hour. Then the rate of fetal descent also increases during this time. Psychological, psychologic response. The mother starts feeling the neck for a break <clears throat> and the mother starts feeling the need for a break she feels like she should rest but of course at this time she will not be able to rest because the pain will be frequent then normal sensation and the reassurance uh, should be given to the mother at this point also the mother will be helpless she feels that he, she may not be able to do it and she feels like she really needs uh, someone to give her support 
Partner stroke support response ensures the partner, uh, the patient, okay, the patient at this time should not be left alone. So the partner should be there to strengthen the patient. Then uh, starts to feel helpless, turns to the nurse uh, for increased participation as their efforts to decrease discomfort seem less effective. The, the patient at this time needs support of the nurse, so she feels like the nurse should be there all the time. For those who have ever been in the labor ward, you have had the uh, patients or the mothers who are in labor calling for the nurse to sit near them, telling the nurse not to move away. Nursing care in first stage. Let us look at the maternal care. So the maternal care we can give at this stage is bathing. If the mother can bathe on her own, uh, that is very well. We can encourage her to take a bath and encourage the ambulation to shorten at the first stage. So we encourage her to move around to make sure that the first stage is shortened. Then also avoid solid and liquid foods at this time. So she is... Are supposed to take foods that are uh, soft to make sure that she can at least have some energy. But those that are solid and those that are liquid are not encouraged. So at this time, also if possible, enema can be given. But at this time, uh, currently we don't talk so much about the enema, so we encourage the mother to uh, pass the stools on her own because if she has the art then let her empty it's okay then at this time also uh, preparation of the perineal area is very very important if the mother has not shaped this is the time that she can uh, be shaved or uh, because of course she will not be able to shave on her own so the partner can do that or the nurse can be able to help her Encourage the emptying of the bladder every two to three minutes. This will help the descent of the uh, fetal head to uh, happen progressively and efficiently without any obstruction. Then we also advise abdominal breathing, encourage sinusy position uh, to make sure that uh, we can be able to observe the mother very well. Then Emotional support is also very important at this time. So right there, we are seeing a picture which shows the fetal uh, heart rate assessment during labor. So you, if you look at that picture uh, closely, you can see that on the other side, there's a partner who is holding the mother's hand. The way the uterus, the, the, the abdomen is looking, it looks like this mother is having contractions. The way you can see it, it looks hard. And the, this is the Doppler, which is being used for monitoring the heart rate of the fetus. Second stage. The second stage is when the baby is pushed out through the birth canal. This may take a few minutes or a few hours, depending on various factors such as a strong urge to push, a feeling of pressure in the rectum, then crowning. So these are the uh, signs and the symptoms of second stage. These are the signs that the mother is already in second stage and the fetus is ready to come out. That pushing is not fact, is not forced. That pushing comes automatically it comes automatically so when the mother is in second stage she will start feeling that urge and of course the pushing will happen physiologic response contractions continue with a frequency of 1.5 to 2 minutes so in this case the contractions will not take long. And he, when they start, they can last for longer seconds. 
they can last for about 60 to 90 seconds so these are now strong contractions that the mother is uh, experiencing so descent of fetus continues until it reaches the perineal flow uh, the mother feel an unbearable urge to begin pushing then the perineum becomes extremely thin and the anus stretches and the protrudes out during this time because of the pressure of the presenting part. Then extension occurs under the symphysis pubis and as a result, delivery yeah, happens. So psychological response, childbirth prepared women feel relieved, pain felt in transition phase is over. So at this time, the mother is targeting as the receiving her baby. So that is severe pain that she was feeling during the transition phase. At this time, she is not feeling it. Why? Because she is having that urge of pushing she will not feel that pain but her focus will be uh, at making sure that the baby comes out so at this time also uh, there's a re relief birth is near and now can push the baby so at this time like i have mentioned that the mother is looking at uh, pushing the baby so she does not have focus on the kind of pain that she is feeling feels a sense of control she feels that she is in charge she is in charge of bringing this baby into the world so she feels she has that control she needs to put in energy to make sure that the fetus comes out the midwives or nurses have always used the words like no one is going to help you to push the baby please push the baby it is your role as the mother to push the baby so such words also stimulate the mother and the, the mother gains that confidence uh, to make sure that uh, she pushes the baby alive then women without childbirth preparation become frightened at this time women who were not counseled during uh antenatal women who were not prepared at this time become scared they feel like they are going to die they feel like this is the end of everything tend to fight each contraction and uh, others telling her to push so at this time if the mother was not uh, uh, prepared very well this is the time that she will become uncooperative and the cases can happen like the mother is clothing they are closing her thighs and you find that you end up losing the baby at a point when the baby is supposed to come out so if the mother was prepared very well these such things cannot happen so uh, the mother may also feel that she lost control and she becomes embarrassed and the apologetic or shows extreme irritability to the people around her so all this can happen during this second stage of labor so what is the nursing care during second stage of labor so here we position the legs of the mother on the stirrups together so uh, we position the mother in the lithotomy position and they carry her legs on the stirrups to make sure that the way for the baby to come out is open. Then we instruct the mother to push and not to pant. So the two are different. Pushing means that she directs her energy through bearing down, downwards. Panting, she can pretend like she is pushing, but the energy is ending at only the chest. So that is the difference. So when we are instructing the mothers, we instruct the mothers to push the energy down, giving instructions like push like you're in the toilet, push like you are pushing 
hardy faces such words can encourage the mother to help her direct the energy where it is required otherwise if you don't instruct the mother well during the second stage of labor she can end up panting until the baby dies right there between her legs then uh, assist in epi episiotomy so the episiotomy is very very important to prevent lacerations but currently episiotomy is not mandatory so the uh, studies show that uh, if the mother has laceration because it is happening naturally it is okay then you will suture afterwards but previously we are used to emphasize on giving of episiotomy but still this is very important in the cases where the perineum seems to be narrow and the, the fetus is not likely to pass through without to any episiotomy if the perineum looks so stressed and this may delay the labor then automatically please give the episiotomy so that this fetus is not uh, asphyxiated then apply retains maneuver during this time this is very important hold the newborn below the mother's uh, vulva then uh, after that cutting of the umbilical cord uh, postponed until pulsation stops so what happens is as the uh, the, the fetus is coming we observe if there's need for episiotomy we give the episiotomy then we make sure that we support the perineum so when the perineum is supported and the fetus all uh, delivered you slide your hand under the armpits then hold the baby and deliver the baby towards the mother's abdomen when the baby is delivered and laid on the mother's abdomen you make sure that the baby uh, rests on the mother's abdomen until the pulsation stop on the umbilical cord and this pulsation takes normally two to three minutes to uh, stop then after that now you can clamp the cord and uh, cut it we encourage this so that the fetus can benefit from that blood that is in the placenta and was meant to go to the fetus once he gets all that blood then is ready to be separated from the placenta patina stroke support response so childbirth prepared women feel relieved and in control during this time she feels like she can be able to overcome she can be able to make it uh relieved birth is near and now can push there's also a feeling of sense of control so women without childbirth preparation may be frightened uh partner stroke supporter actively support actively encourages pushing so the partner who is uh, right near the mother should do, give that encouragement of her to push then instructions to push through the pain and the burning so we encourage the mothers that when the pain comes this is when she is supposed to push because that is when the urge of pushing is there then the third stage the third stage is when the placenta is delivered usually within 30 minutes after the birth of the baby so this one uh, after delivering of the baby you have separated the baby from the placenta contractions will resume so when the contraction is resume there's that feeling of relief and the expulsion of the placenta will happen so placental separation and the delivery how does this happen placental separation so uterus contracts firmly reducing surface area 
Then after that, the placenta begins to separate from the uh, endometrium. That is, those are the walls of the uterus. Then the separation accompanied by bleeding and the, a hematoma between placental tissue and the decidua. So the hematoma is that accumulated blood which forms a form of a clot is what we are referring to as a hematoma. So when this is formed between the placental tissue and the decidua, it encourages further separation of the placenta until it's delivered. So hematoma speeds up the process. Membranes are the last two are uh, separated. Signs of separation appear within 50 to 30 minutes after birth. So signs include a globular shaped uterus, a rise of the fundus in the abdomen, a sudden gush or trickle of blood, and the further protrusion of the uh, umbilical cord out of the uh, vagina. So the umbilical cord in most cases will lengthen as the um, placenta is separating from the endometrium. So this is what happens. And the fetus is born. When the baby is born, the first thing is to check to make sure that there is no another second fetus before we continue to the third stage, which will involve administration of oxytocin and then delivery. So what is the nursing care during third stage of labor? So during the third stage of labor, do not hurry the expulsion of the placenta. Don't force it. Don't hurry it. Let it happen naturally. Don't, uh, don't employ force in pulling the placenta. Traction of the cord slowly we're wind, winding it around the clamp until the placenta comes out. So this is what we call the Brand Andrews uh, uh, method. It is when when you separate the placenta uh, the, from the baby, the placenta will remain clamped. So you can roll uh, the cord. With the, the clamped side of the cord, you can roll it on the faucet that you have used for clamping. You roll it, you roll it. So as the placenta is separating, you keep on tracking it. We call it tracking. You have seen a midwife's owners holding the, um, uh, the, the cord and the, they feel, they be like they are pulling. They are not pulling. They are not uh, employing a lot of force. It's just a gentle, just the gentle force that is uh, being employed, and this is called the traction. So they are tracking uh, the placenta slowly until it comes out. So when the placenta is delivered, you check for completeness of the cotyledons. The cotyledons are those seed-like um, portions of the placenta which are found on the maternal side, the side that was attached. You check to see that they are all there. There's none that is missing. If there's any that thing, you will see it uh, detached. You will see it like it is being removed. Okay. It, there will be a kind of depression from uh, it. Then uh, palpate the uterus to determine the degree of contraction. Then after that, inject oxytocin. So women may bear down to aid in placental expulsion when signs of the delivery of the placenta appear. So if it fails, gentle traction may be uh, applied to the cord while pressure is exerted on the fundus. The placenta is considered retained if 30 minutes have passed uh, since the completion of the second stage. 
that is when we can now take action. That means that the placenta is retained and we need to really act fast. So two mechanisms can occur. We have the uh, scoots mechanism, which is referred to as the shiny scoots and the, the Duncan mechanism, which is the dirty Duncan. Now, when delivering, when delivering the placenta, we need to uh, make sure that we practice what is currently uh, encouraged by WHO. By uh, WHO uh, recommendations state that we use the uh, traction uh, method, the controlled code traction method, and it is the one that is currently being used to make sure that cases of postpartum hemorrhage are avoided to uh, minimize maternal mortality, which is currently a major problem in the world. So let's look at SCULTC mechanism versus Duncan mechanism. SCULTC mechanism, placenta separates from inside to outer margins. So it separates from the center to the outer margins. Uh, it is expelled on the fetal uh, or the shiny side. And in most cases, if you hold it well, you receive it in your two cupped hands, you find that there is no too much split of blood in the area where you have the mother from. That is why it is referred to as the clean method or the shiny method. Whereas the Duncan mechanism, here the placenta separates from outer margins, inwards it starts from the sides then it is separates inwards so it rolls up and presents sideways with the maternal surface first and this is why it is referred to as the dirty uh, method why because when this placenta separates in that way more blood will come out uh, first before even the placenta is delivered ending up messing the whole area of the liver. So these are the two ways, uh, two mechanisms. As you can see, the school mechanism is the smart one or the shiny one, uh, where uh, because of its separation from the center, the blood collects within the maternal side and as it is being delivered, uh, it will be wrapped in the membranes and the, the placenta all comes out when it is shiny and it is smart. Whereas the Duncan method or the, the Matthew Duncan method, you can see that because of its separation from the side, much of the blood comes out even before the placenta is being uh, delivered. That's why it is referred to as the data method. Maternal physiologic readjustment. So after delivery, we have looked at delivery up to the third stage. We have looked at labor up to the third stage. So what happens next? So after that, the mother's body starts readjusting itself. So within one to the, uh, within the first to the fourth hour after birth, when physiological readjustments of the mother's body begin, there are these changes that can happen in the body. And one of them are the hemodynamic changes. So here, this include blood loss, which ranges from 250 to 500 milliliters. Then moderate drop in systolic, stroke, diastolic uh, beeping. Then there is also increased uh, pulse pressure, and there is the moderate tachycardia. So tachycardia, we know this is the increase in the heart rate. So in this case, the pulse of the mother will increase. Then uh, in the uterine changes, the uterus remains contracted and is midline in the abdomen. So uh, the fundus is usually midway between the symphysis pubis and the 
the umbilicus. This, the, it is in the middle, just below the umbilicus and the, above the symphysis pubis. So after the birth of the placenta, the cervix is widely spread and is thick. Maternal sensations, nausea and vomiting during transition will stop. So the nausea and vomiting that was that happened during the transition stops at this time because whatever that would have caused this has now been removed out of the body, so the mother is free. So woman may feel thirsty, hungry, or experience shaking chills. So this can normally be observed. The bladder is hypotonic due to trauma or anesthetic anesthetics which may lead to urinary retention so sometimes the bladder cannot contract that is why we say it is hypotonic so as a result the mother will not be able to pass urine so she may end up release um, uh, she may end up uh, holding the urine or retaining the urine but we do encourage mothers to pass the urine even if they are not feeling if they don't feel the urine. Why? Because of the, the bladder being hypotonic, they will not be able to feel the urine even if the bladder is full. So in this case, if not emptied, it can uh, make the uterus not to contract and as a result, the mother may end up with postpartum hemorrhage. So factors affecting the length of normal labor. One is the size and position of the baby. The, how the baby is positioned means whether the labor can go for long or not. So in most cases, big babies can lead to uh, prolonged labor. This is because their navigation throughout the pelvis to find a way of coming out will take long. The strength and the frequency of contractions. When the contractions are weak, the labor will be slow. The dilatation and the effacement of the cervix. If the cervix is dilating slowly and effacing slowly, the labor will also take long. The mother's physical and emotional state. If she has doubt, if she is stressed, it may delay the labor. The mother's level of pain and the coping, does she endure the pain, does she cope, it also determines how the labor will progress. The presence or absence of interventions such as induction, epidural or cesarean section can also determine the length of labor. So let's look at mechanism of labor. How does labor happen? So one is descent. The baby's head descends deeper into the pelvis with each contraction prompted by gravity and the uterine contractions. And this now aligns the baby's head with the birth canal. Flexion. The baby's head tucks chin to her chest, flexing at the neck. This reduces the head C diameter for easier passage to make sure that you can easily come out. First, this flexion is facilitated by the shape of the birth canal. So if this now takes us back to the cervix, if this, uh, I mean it to the pelvis, if the pelvis is shaped like the one for men, android, then this will not be able to happen. But if it is a gynecoid pelvis, then this will be able to happen. The fetus will flex and as a result, will be born uh, very well. And internal rotation, the baby's head rotates 45 degrees to face the mother's coccyx. So the baby, the, 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 the rotation takes place to make sure that the face of the baby faces the maternal coccyx, which is the back of the mother. Then positions the smallest diameter of the head for optimal 
descent. So the smallest diameter of the head is positioned to make sure that the descent can occur uh, optimally, occur effectively to make sure that the fetus comes out without problem. Then you triggered by the resistance of the pelvic uh, floor muscles. So it's the pelvic floor muscles that will trigger this internal rotation. Then extension, the baby's head delivers by extending the neck. So as the neck extends, the baby's head will appear through the vagina as it uh, comes out. Crowning occurs as the uh, head becomes visible at the vaginal opening. So when, if you have ever conducted labor, you see that as the baby, the, the head of the baby tries to come out with the contractions, when the mother pushes, it comes out. Then when the contractions go off, when she does not feel the desire to push, it goes back. That is what is called the resetting. Resetting. So when time reaches, when she pushes, the contractions go off, but the head does not recede. It does not go back. This is the state where we encourage her to push whether she's having the contractions or she's not having the contractions. Because at this stage, if the baby stays at that uh, stage for some time, the baby will uh, be asphyxiated. So that stage is what we call crowning. Crowning is where when the mother pushes, the baby's head does not recede even when the contractions are off. And this is facilitated by maternal pushing and uterine contractions. That is the extension. External rotation. So after the head is delivered, the baby's head rotates back. 45 degrees to face the mother's thigh. When the baby's head is coming out, as it crumbs and it comes out, the face of the fetus is facing the mother's anus or the mother's back. But as it delivers out, it rotates 45 degrees to make sure that it turns and faces the thigh of the mother, be it on the right thigh or the left thigh. So this allows for the delivery of the shoulders and it occurs naturally as the shoulders rotate to follow the head. So at, as this delivers, as the head delivers and as it rotates the 45 degrees, we don't encourage touching of the head. You can touch the head, but you don't apply any force. Some midwives will apply force wanting to pull the baby, wanting to, to grab the neck of the baby. This is the time that you can end up causing trauma to the baby. This is the time that you can end up injuring the uh, bones of the neck of the baby because you don't know which direction this external rotation is going to take. So leave it to take its course. And then expulsion. The baby's, uh, the baby's body is delivered by further ex uh, flexion and extension. Shoulders deliver first, then followed by the rest of the body. So once the shoulders have appeared, you grab the fetus under the shoulders, and then as it delivers, you direct the body of the, uh, the, the, the baby towards the mother's abdomen. Maternal pushing and uterine contractions continue to aid delivery. So maternal analgesia and anesthesia, opioids, analgesics. So here the analgesics, we have the meperidine, which is HCL, uh, can be given IV, IM, epidural, intrathecal, or can be given during active labor. Then uh, we have butophenol, uh, which can be given IM 30 to 40 times more potent than demerol. 
people. So these ones are more potent than we have looked at above. So does not interfere with the labor. So the mother will be relieved from the pain, but she will, the, the labor progress will not be interfered with. Opiates, analgesics, we have the nalbufine or nubine, which can be IV or IM. Then we have fentanyl, and these ones can be given IV or IM or can be given epidural or intrathecal. Then uh, it is 100 times more potent than the MRO. Mm, then uh, we look at the regional analgesia and anesthesia. Epidural. The epidural anesthesia may be used during labor or cesarean section to make sure that the mother does not feel any pain. Then spinal. Uh, may be used during labor or anesthesia during cesarean section. Then we have the local infiltration uh, can be used during episiotherapy. Uh, so these are the uh, analgesics that can be used under the anesthesia. So the nursing care for analgesia and the anesthesia and anesthesia Anesthesia. Here we need to observe the mother and the newborn for respiratory depression. Why? Because they can have effect on the respiratory, uh, uh, the respiration of the mother and the fetus. Then we also monitor the BP for maternal hypotension. Then use an infusion control device for IV administration and maintain fetal monitoring. Uh, have oxygen and the emergency resuscitation equipment available. So up to there, that marks the end of our lecture for today. Uh, is there any question? Yes, uh, I have some suggestion it actually is not a question mm. uh, i'm suggesting if you know some some people have dif different uh, mode of reading mm. for me for me i prefer if the notes are available you put them as on the whatsapp uh, platform as as documents not the uh, not the youtube uh, recording because I may go and download and then better I read so that you understand that. But I appreciate your presentation. I really understood something better. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, Samuel, you're noting that. As you share the video, it's very important for you to share the notes with the students to make sure that they can uh, read at their ample time. Samuel, are you with us? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think after that, I get to... That, that's the second thing, uh, maybe to Samuel. Uh, mm. 